This video was brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Browsing the web is fun and all, but it does have its snags. Most of the time, folks are not even aware of the amount of surveillance, limitation, and data mining happening to them on a daily basis, and dealing with them is not too obvious. Adobe already used your products. Please stop showing me your products. With Surfshark VPN, however, you have an easy one-for-all solution. On Windows, Android, or one of those shiny Apple products, with the click of a button, Surfshark turns you into an anonymous and hard-to-track user, giving you more freedom on the internet, keeps you away from prying eyes, and prevents companies from doing things like geo-blocking, where video and streaming services restrict your library simply because of where you live. Surfshark makes all of that a non-issue though. You start up their service, choose your location, refresh the page, and there you go. Your favorite show that you couldn't watch because you dared to live somewhere else. And those that use the link in the description below and enter the special code Johnny will not only get 83% off their initial order, but the next three months are also completely free. Hell of a deal. Thanks to Surfshark VPN for the sponsor. Now sit back and relax because we got quite a video on our hands today. Super Nintendo. Now we're talking here. So this is where I finally jumped into the series proper. I saw Final Fantasy 1 in action growing up, but Final Fantasy 4 was the first one I actually played all the way back in 1994, 1995. I don't remember the exact specifics, but I do know for certain that this was the first RPG I ever played, beaten, and loved. Yeah, it says Final Fantasy 2. It was the second game we got here in America. That's why the name was changed. You think that's where fucking European players wouldn't see their first Final Fantasy until Final Fantasy 7. And I'm amazed they didn't just call that Final Fantasy 1. Wait, what's that? Oh, no, that's right. I'm sorry. Their first Final Fantasy was Mystic Quest. Ooh, man, Mystic Quest. That is a video for later. But Final Fantasy IV was the one Square wanted all their attention on for the launch of the Super Nintendo. Trying to start off strong and all that, but it's funny because Final Fantasy IV started life as another NES game. One that according to Hironobu Sakaguchi was about 80% complete before being reworked for the SNES. And 80% shit, if I was a developer for that game and I found out it was being altered that late in progression, I'd be like, we better be keeping some of that shit for the transition. And if that wasn't crazy enough, they were also in the process of making yet another Final Fantasy at around the same time. Before deciding to make Final Fantasy IV their launch SNES title, the plan was one more game for the NES and one on the SNES not too far after. I think they were frantically playing catch up with the Dragon Quest series, which at this point was seeing its fifth entry as early as 1992, and almost as if Square was going like, ooh, ooh, me too, that planned Super Nintendo entry would later become Final Fantasy V. So because of the decision to shift consoles, the devs only had about a year to make Final Fantasy IV an SNES game from this point. And judging from the game's looks, I think it's clear that Final Fantasy IV is essentially a polished NES game. It certainly doesn't sound like an NES game, and of course the new battle effects for magic spells and all that are caliber above the 8-bit games, but compare the overworld graphics to this and say Final Fantasy III, the simple menus as well, the leap wasn't that substantial. And Palum, do not care there, buddy? I told you to stay away from my edibles, you little shit. Takashi Tokido would take the helm as lead designer for this one. He was already employed by Square for around six years doing graphic design and sound effects for other games, but this was his first major contribution to the franchise, one that would clearly temper his will because he would later be a director for Chrono Trigger, along with Akihiko Matsui, who also helped develop the active time battle system for Final Fantasy IV, which we'll get into later. A few of the devs from here would later work on Chrono Trigger, some even leaving Square altogether and forming their own company, like Tetsuya Takahashi. Yeah, the founder of Monolith Soft and the creator of the Xeno series. It's always fascinating to learn that all these eventual creators of other RPG franchises have roots in Final Fantasy in one way or another. Now, this game is by no means perfect. We're going to get into it soon enough, but regardless of what I have to say, it cannot be stressed how Final Fantasy IV is one of the most important and influential games of my childhood. I touched upon it during the Final Fantasy I video, but it was this game that told me video games are more than just hopping on Goombas and rolling through shuttle loops at high speeds. They could be so much more. And as for the version I'm sticking to for this video, Here's the thing. So Final Fantasy IV was a super fucking successful game for Square. There were so many versions released throughout the years, so many re-releases. I'm, I'm talking the Super Nintendo, the Wonder Swan, PlayStation, Game Boy Advance, the Nintendo DS, PSP, your PC. It's everywhere and it's slowly gaining sentience. The original Super Nintendo release for North America is the one I have the earliest memories of and the one I played the most compared to the PSP release. But this version has its hiccups. The translation hasn't aged well in the slightest. It's kind of bad, excluding the Spoonie Bard line, and the final boss emphasizing your futile efforts with silly. 
It removed almost all the unique abilities every character had that gave them an identity beyond just being another body for the count. It also neutered some gameplay elements for the sake of making the journey overall easier, which I won't knock them too much for. I get wanting to ease in new players, especially for a new console launch. While more than playable, it's not my preferred way of playing the game anymore. And while I would just head into what I think is the best version of the game, that's the PSP version with the sexy 2D visuals and the extra content from the GBA release, I wanted to keep things on the Super Nintendo for this one, to honor the game's 16-bit roots. Why wouldn't I just play the version on Final Fantasy Chronicles for the PlayStation 1 then you might be asking? Good question. I decided to stick with another fan translation for this one, the Naming Way Edition, a great translation that's closer to the GBA and PSP script with little to no edgy cringe, the original Japanese difficulty, all of the character abilities intact, a dash button to make some dungeon and town visits a little less time consuming, and it keeps the developer's room too, the place where you can fight some of the game's development team in battles including Tetsuya Takahashi, eat shit Tetsuya Takahashi, Jesus Christ. Obviously, I recommend you buy yourself an official copy before you download a fan translation for your emulator or EverDrive. I got like eight to nine copies of this fucking game. I think I'm good. And if you end up enjoying your time with the 16-bit original, might I recommend you give the 3D version a try too. Now, I know for sure I wasn't going to make this the focal point for this video. And don't get me wrong, it's a great rendition of Final Fantasy IV, but my god, it's so hard. <laughs> Especially if you played the original game, you think you know what to expect. Uh-uh, this version will repeatedly fuck with you and make you rethink every strategy you could ever muster against these guys. It's Final Fantasy IV for those who want a little more hair on their balls. Or if you don't got balls, I don't know, your ass cheeks. Let's get things started. The fourth Final Fantasy my first Final Fantasy. No traditional white text on blue background this time around, our story immediately jumps to the Kingdom of Baron's Red Wings flying to the town of Mycidia to claim their elemental crystal for their own. The soldiers of Baron, however, are not quite sure why they're doing this, robbing innocent people of their sacred relics, something that Captain of the Red Wings, Cecil Harvey, cannot help but silently agree on, but he's quick to tell his troops that the king's orders are absolute and that for the good of the kingdom, they must do what he asks. However, as soon as he delivers the crystal back to his kingdom and begins to ask the meaning behind the mission, for the sake of easing his guilt probably, the king immediately strips Cecil of his rank and makes him a glorified errand boy. He's tasked with slaying the Eidolon inside the nearby Mist Cave and delivering a package to the village of Mist, home of the summoners. And though heavily reluctant, especially since his girlfriend Rosa is also concerned for his well-being given everything that's happened recently, Cecil agrees to the mission, but this time he's joined by his longtime friend Kane, a highly skilled dragoon. The two set off to the village, being repeatedly warned by a mysterious voice to turn back. Pressing onward though, they eventually encounter a dragon made of mist, killing it in a matter of time because the dragon really didn't have any other strategy besides turning into mist for a bit. Upon arriving at the village, the package the king handed Cecil suddenly opens and out comes a salvo of firebombs, burning the village and killing a bunch of innocents. Outraged that he was used by the king again to slay innocents, Cecil renounces his duties to Baron completely and vows to put an end to this madness, with Cain agreeing to join along as he too realizes that the king has gone too far. However, they realize that the two of them are not enough to face against Baron's armies and that Rosa is still in the kingdom and could be in danger, so they make it a point to travel the country and enlist the aid of whoever can help take on Baron's might. Cecil and Cain then come across a young girl in the burning village mourning the loss of her mother, who died because her dragon of mist was also killed. With Cecil and Cain doing a collective, <laughs> the girl soon realizes that the two are responsible for her mother's death and the village being roasted, and responds unkindly by summoning a big beefy titan to decimate the two and causing a tremor large enough to collapse the entryway to the village. Cecil soon regains consciousness with the little girl collapsed by his side and Cain nowhere to be seen. Cecil then takes the young girl to the nearby desert town of Kaipo to nurse her back to health, and despite Cecil's good intentions, the girl isn't in a very talkative mood. Which is understandable, she just lost her mom and village and all that. That very night though, a group of Baron soldiers crash the inn and attempt to murder the little girl to finish the king's job. Cecil is quick to put them in their place however, and the little girl, witnessing Cecil risk his life to protect her, finally opens up to him, revealing her name to be Rydia. Which I think was supposed to be Lydia, but I think I speak for everyone when I say Rydia is an infinitely better name. The next day, Cecil learns that Rosa is also in town. While attempting to learn of Cecil's whereabouts after the village incident, she's fallen ill with desert fever, with Cecil needing a sand ruby to cure her condition. On their way to find that sand ruby, Cecil and Rydia come across Tella, an old sage that requests the use of Cecil's skills as a dark knight to slay a monster blocking the path to Damsian. For his daughter Anna has eloped with a wandering bard and being an old curmudgeon, he doesn't exactly approve of the idea. I get being protective of your children, but Tella definitely comes across as the racist grandpa you begrudgingly invite to Thanksgiving given despite your instinct saying otherwise. 
After crossing the waterway south of the Damsian Kingdom, the gang make way to the castle, but then the Red Wings suddenly swoop in and bomb the whole fucking place, stealing the castle's fire crystal in the process. Inside, Tella is appalled to see that his daughter has fallen victim to the Red Wings attack, immediately lashing out against her fiancé who managed to survive, who is in fact the Prince of Damsian, Edward. Managing to get a few words in before passing on, Anna asks Tella for forgiveness and to stop bonking Edward with his stick, for she truly loves him. Edward informs the group that a man named Golbez has been appointed the new captain of the Red Wings and wants to collect the rest of the crystals across the planet. In a rage, Tella storms off, hell-bent on getting revenge, with Edward joining the party after having little to no time to grieve the loss of Anna, his parents, and his kingdom. It's sort of fucked up, too, because Rydia and Cecil get on Edward's ass about sulking when he's clearly not the only one who's lost something and there isn't time to mourn, but it's like, Jesus, guys, you can give him a little more than five fucking seconds. Cecil even slaps the shit out of Edward to knock him out of his emotional stupor. He just lost his family, dude. I'd be in shock too, asshole. Anyway, Edward helps Cecil obtain a sand ruby from the ant lion's den and uses it to nurse Rosa back to health. Their next destination is the Fabul Kingdom, located just beyond Mount Hobbs, east of Damsian. During the climb up, they run into a high monk of Fabul being attacked by more of Golbez's monsters and jump into the rescue. The monk introduces himself as Yang, and depending on the version you're playing, his battle cries can sound more like sneezing than yelling, but as thanks, he's willing to help Cecil and the crew plead their case to Fabul's king. Thankfully, the king is more than willing to fend off against Baron's forces to protect the crystal, but soon the Red Wings show up and start their raid with our heroes back into a corner despite giving it their all, and to rub salt in the wound, Kane suddenly shows up and starts attacking Cecil, and then the big cheese himself, Golbez, enters the scene, he takes the crystal, then kidnaps Rosa when he realizes Cecil harbors feelings for the girl. Another crystal lost, betrayed by an old friend, and his girlfriend being kidnapped? Things are looking pretty fucked, but the gang is determined to press forward. They get the idea to travel to Baron by boat, since while they have an elite air force, their naval crew is non-existent as far as I can tell, I didn't really see any boats while I was over there. So the gang sets off to Baron via boat, but then the ship is suddenly attacked by the ancient Leviathan, knocking Rydia overboard with Yang diving in immediately to try and rescue her. Edward is then knocked unconscious, and the whole boat is swallowed into a gargantuan whirlpool. Makes you wonder what kind of cosmic force really has it out for Cecil and friends. It's something shitty around every corner. I mean, Christ. Cecil wakes up alone, stranded far from Baron, but thankfully there is a town nearby and it's my city. <laughs> oh my God. The one town he ended up near and it's the place that hates his freaking guts. And the townspeople are out for fucking blood too. You don't fight anyone, but talk to some of them. They'll turn you into a frog. They'll poison your drink at the bar. One of them even turns you into a pig after enticing you with the dance. The bacon of Baron. I deserve... All of this. But Cecil soon talks with the elder of the village, who senses that Cecil is destined for greater things and has his heart in the right place. He challenges Cecil to climb Mount Ordeals. Mount Ordeals, very subtle game. To earn the village's trust, Cecil must take the oath of the paladin and renounce his ways of the Dark Knight. And this is something I always found a little odd about Cecil's character arc. Um, bearing this one dancer in the beginning of the game who swears she paid her taxes this time, Cecil was shown to be a good person down to the core, and it's never really implied that he was a bastard beforehand. So does his profession as Dark Knight really have anything to do with anything? It's not what defines him. If Cecil were a fucking scholar, I'm sure he read my city in the beginning no differently. Now, he's clearly conflicted since the beginning of the game because of his actions in my city. Is it right to follow the king's orders even if it means harming innocents? Can he gather the strength necessary to overcome his guilt and become a better person for it? Again, though, that doesn't really have anything to do with him being a dark knight. Now, if he were slowly being corrupted by his dark blade's influence, maybe his actions got more erratic this time past, maybe that's why he was such a dick to Edward for one thing, then that'd be different. But having Cecil take the paladin oath doesn't really resolve anything for Cecil's inner turmoil, because I don't think the issue lies with him being a dark knight. It's just something I wanted to reflect on for a moment. But in the end, Cecil agrees to climb Mount Ordeals if it means earning the trust of the Mycidians and receiving their aid. Accompanying him on this journey are two of the Elder's greatest students, Palum and Porum, Five-year-olds, gifted in magic, who are also sent to secretly spy on Cecil to make sure he's true to his word. Five-year-old magicians who are also spies. Only in an RPG. They're sweet kids outside of that, Palum is the hothead who is quick to boast how great of a magician he is, with Porum just as quick to put him back in his place with a loud <laughs> During the climb up Mount Ordeals, Cecil reunites with Tella, who is making the climb himself because he believes the ancient magic Meteo rests somewhere within the mountain. Tella wants to harness its power to kill Golbez and avenge his deceased daughter, rejoining Cecil's party to make the journey a little less taxing for the old man. But then the gang is suddenly attacked by Skarmelian, one of the four elemental archfiends working under Golbez, and... Oh, I love this boss music so much. I'm sorry, we gotta talk about this now. 
The jump in audio quality between Final Fantasy 3 on the NES and this game on the Super Nintendo is so fucking vast. Yeah, it's better technology, sure, but Nobuo Imatsu was doing some sort of mystic magic here because, oh my god, this soundtrack is beyond stellar, and not just as an SNES game, just period. Final Fantasy IV has some of my favorite dungeon themes in the whole series. I never tire of Into the Darkness, the standard cavern theme. The boss battle theme, heard as soon as you battle the Mist Dragon, just around 15 minutes into your playthrough, it's so threatening. Like, are you prepared to die, little man? It's unnerving. But the battle against the four fiends, amazing. Makes you feel like you're at a real turning point of the plot whenever it's used. The theme of Fabul. Powerful. The theme of Troya. Gorgeous. Within the giant, play when you're inside the titular giant in the final area of the game as a way of emphasizing how far you've come along in your journey. Oh, this is so, 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 so good. Play the game. Damn, this music is so great. So great. Skarmelian is no match for the combined powers of Cecil and his toddler brigade, and soon after, Cecil is greeted by a mysterious voice who calls Cecil his son, and then proceeds to bless the Dark Knight with a powerful sword of light, transforming Cecil into a paladin. Which, despite not really meaning anything for Cecil's character growth, I think, it's still a cool moment I love experiencing every time. Tella also learns the Meteo spell upon seeing Cecil get his class upgrade, so yeah, that's, um, that's nice and convenient. With the trust of the Elder Urn, Cecil makes his way back to Baron using my city as magical Devil Road and reunites with Yang after smacking some sense into him after being brainwashed by Baron's army. From there, the gang managed to infiltrate the castle using a secret waterway, and then discover that the king wasn't really the king at all, but another one of the elemental archfiends in disguise, Cognazo. I do wonder how he managed to fit all of that into this tiny ass frame. Damn impressive. Cognazo is soon slain, but before dying, he attempts to kill our heroes by collapsing the walls, but Palam and Purim then sacrifice themselves by turning into stone statues, preventing the walls from moving any closer. This game is just killing children left and right, I should have saved the drinks for this game. The resolve stronger than ever, Cecil and the gang take to the skies thanks to the Enterprise, courtesy of Sid, the kingdom's engineer. I wasn't really able to fit him into the summary earlier since he only shows up one other time before and is during the game's opening minutes. This is Sid. Airship Engineer. Bit of a loudmouth, but he has the distinction of being the franchise's first playable Sid. He joins your party for a bit, he wields a large hammer for a weapon, and he can scan enemies for weaknesses, so he's a scholar that's actually worth a damn. I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep harping on scholars, I'm sure they're wonderful people. Sid gives us our first airship as thanks for rescuing him. Alright, time to explore the world with a new sense of freedom and god damn it. Kane rears his traitorous head and offers Cecil a deal. He promises the safety of Rosa if Cecil manages to collect the last crystal gold as needs. Not seeing any real choice in the matter, Cecil agrees and heads to the kingdom of Troya to ask for their assistance. Unfortunately, their crystal was stolen by a dark elf who has stowed away in his hideout which is also underneath a humongous magnetic barrier that prevents anyone wearing anything metal from entering. It's actually because because of this that Golbez and Kane get Cecil to do their dirty work because they're having trouble figuring out how to bypass the magnetic barrier themselves, and with what Golbez is wearing normally, I mean, can you blame him? In lighter news, it turns out Edward survived the Leviathan ambush from earlier but is bedridden for the remainder of the game. I really just said that was lighter news. Still, he's willing to help Cecil and company deal with the Dark Elf and his barrier by using this whisper weed and playing some of Edward's greatest hits through it like a magical walkie-talkie. <laughs> Everyone's a critic, but it's enough to subdue the Dark Elf, so that's all that matters. The crystal is retrieved, and Kane is quick to pick Cecil up, leading him to Golbez's HQ, the Tower of Zot. It's weird that we never physically see this locale from the outside. Maybe it's like the floating castle from Dragon Quest V? Who knows? At last, the gang managed to reach Golbez and give up the crystal, but with Golbez immediately turning a blind eye to the deal, Tella quickly confronts Tall, Dark, and Handsome and tries everything in his power to stop him. 
Realizing nothing is working, Tella resorts to using Meteo, managing to actually hurt Golbez and relinquishing came from his mind control in the process, but the cost is too great for Tella soon dies from using too much of his life force to cast a spell. Before passing on, Tella realizes that his need for vengeance is what ultimately cost him his life, so leave it to him to tell Cecil to avenge his death before fading away. What? An injured Golbez retaliates by attacking our heroes but hesitates upon staring at the down Cecil. Perhaps it's his ravishing good looks now that he's a full-fledged paladin. Cecil does make for one of the prettier men of Final Fantasy. Golbez leaves with the crystal and Rosa is saved from a date with the guillotine, or in the original SNES release, a giant ball. But then the third of the elemental archfiends, Barbarisha, appears and attempts to finish what Golbez could not, but thanks to Kane and his mighty ability to jump really high, that plan is quickly snuffed. Better luck next time. So Golbez has all the crystals. All seems lost, but then Kane reveals that Golbez only has half of the planet's crystals, for there are also four dark crystals located in the planet's subterranean level, the Underworld. Golbez's plan is to collect all the planet's crystals to gain access to the moon, where untold power is said to sleep. Oh boy, dark crystals. Here we go again. Kane gives the party an ancient relic, which is said to open a way to the planet's underworld, and before the nearby townspeople can say, HOLY SHIT! The path to the underworld is open with the group heading straight to hell. But just seconds later, they're caught in a crossfire between Golbez's forces and the Dwarven Armada. The airship is shot down, but thankfully they manage to land near the Dwarven Kingdom of Geot, and the Dwarves themselves are a pretty friendly bunch. They agree to help Cecil in their predicament as long as they help them protect their crystal, but then Golbez manages to infiltrate the castle anyway, sending a bunch of creepy dolls to try and kill the heroes. And when that doesn't work, Golbez himself enters the fray and almost manages to kill the whole gang. Say what you will about Golbez, but you gotta respect the direct approach. He didn't pull the trigger on Cecil earlier and the tower is up, but he's about to make up for that and then some. He knows he's down three archfiends, he took a Meteo spell earlier, no more nonsense, no more talking, just wipe them all out one by one with the Shadow Dragon. Oh, I love this scene. I just love how it emphasizes how cool of a villain Golbez can be. But then it gets better because just when it looks like this is the end of Cecil and his obnoxious string of bad luck, the Mist Dragon suddenly shows up. It decimates Golbez's pet and Cecil is brought back to his feet. Rydia makes one hell of a return, saving the day and looking a lot older to boot. Thanks to Rydia's summoning power, Golbez is stopped dead in his tracks, or so we think, because while the gang is licking their wounds from that massive ass kicking, Golbez is hand manages to slowly, and I mean slowly, inch its way towards the kingdom's crystal and steal it from under the gang's nose. No wait, did I say under their nose? I mean while the gang is watching the whole fucking thing happen. Fucking do something, guys! Also, what the hell? Golbez turns into Thing from Adam's family, steals the crystal, and this sort of ability is never brought up again. These guys cannot catch a fucking break. Every time they try and throw an evil planet, it backfires. It's a good thing that everyone else are such good chums about this, because in any other game, you know, folks would be like, oh, fuck these guys. They can't do shit. <laughs> Give me some competent heroes. Anyway, Rydia explains that after the whole Leviathan incident, she was taken to the Feymark, the land of the summons. And since the flow of time was different in there than it was everywhere else, we now have an older Rydia. With the airship out of commission for the time, the Dwarven King insists that Cecil and the gang head to the Tower of Babel and reclaim the crystals Golbez has in his collection while his army distracts Golbez's forces. And it does seem like a good place to take a nap too. Good shit, King. The gang infiltrate the tower, encountering the eccentric Dr. Lugay in the process, putting him down in no time, but not before he sets the tower's super cannon to wipe out the Dwarves' army. Yang stays behind to stop the cannon, sacrificing himself to destroy the control room, causing it to explode. The gang nearly die when Golbez collapses the floor underneath our hero's feet, but Sid makes the save in the nick of time with the newly repaired airship, except oh shit, not really, because they're immediately hounded by Golbez's air force. Sid tells Cecil to head back to the surface world to keep things moving and then jumps out of the ship and blows himself up to stop the Red Wings from following. Why did he jump out of the airship? Pretty sure he could have just thrown the bomb out and still stopped them. Look at the size of the explosion, especially in the 3D version. Sid didn't need to jump out of the ship. I know this is just the means to keep party slots open for future members to join in, but it gets silly to a point. We're back in Final Fantasy 2. People are just dying left and right. Thanks to Sid's assistance, the gang managed to find a way back into the Tower of Babel from the surface world. Along the way, they recruit the young Edge, the prince of the Eblin kingdom who studied the way of the ninja. And look at him, blending in with the floor. He's learned well. So he's a bit of a hothead, more so than Palom if you can believe it, and he gets him into trouble because he gets his ass kicked by the last of the elemental archfiends Rubicante, probably the coolest of the archfiends ironically enough because he's a master of fire, but he believes in a fair fight. You get further into the tower and face him before reaching the crystal room, and he heals your whole party before the battle. I love a respectable bad guy. He is definitely naked under that robe though. After defeating the last of the archfiends, it looks as if the party is about to reclaim all the crystals Golbez has taken, but up, oh, a trapdoor greets our friends and they fall all the way back down to the bottom portion of the tower. 
back in the underworld. Shit, if they could fall that far and live no worse for wear, then I guess Sid really didn't need to rescue them beforehand in the first place. You die for nothing, Sid. The gang managed to commandeer one of Golbez's airships as a consolation prize, however, and leave the tower once again licking their wounds. And since this airship can't travel over magma, to which I say bullshit, it can't, the gang rendezvous back in the Dwarven Kingdom, where it turns out Sid survived his little suicide bombing and he just needed a nap. He coached the ship in Mithril so that it can travel over magma, and I can only assume he was capable of shitting it out of his ass because how the fuck did he survive that explosion otherwise? With only one crystal remaining to protect, the Dwarven King gives Cecil the key to the sealed cave where the last crystal remains. And you'll never guess what happens next. The gang reaches the crystal, they get the crystal, and then Golbez brainwashes Kane to steal the crystal. Holy shit, these fucking guys. That's it, Golbez now has all the crystals, it's over. Except not really, because it's told in legend when shit goes foobar, the lunar whale can lead the way to salvation. Or something like that. Of course, this is an RPG. All legends are true. The party heads back to Mycidia, and with the prayer of the Elder and all of his disciples joined together, the lunar whale emerges from the ocean, giving the team a way to head to the moon. That's right, the moon. The lunar whale saw that jumping shit from the Invincible in the last game and said, hold my fucking crystal. You go to the moon, and there you meet moon people. And there's a moy face here for some reason. It's Santa Claus. Santa's a moon person. I fucking knew it. No, this is Fusoya, a Lunarian. Watcher of his people and this crystal palace that now sort of triggers a fight or flight response in me. Fusoya explains that long ago Lunarians tried to coexist with the people of the blue planet, but decided to wait on that a bit to let the planet's inhabitants evolve into higher beings. One Lunarian named Zemus, however, wanted to rule over the blue planet, but was placed in a deep slumber to keep him in check. But sleep did nothing to stop his evil ambition, for he was able to manipulate the emotions of people on the blue planet anyway, such as Golbez. So Golbez is being manipulated by Zemus. And on top of that, it turns out Cecil's father was also a Lunarian named Cluya. And that's nice doesn't really mean anything, but it explains the voice Cecil heard in Mount Ordeals earlier. Through Golbez, Zemus wishes to use the power of the crystals to awaken the giant of Babel and wipe out all life on the blue planet. Fusoya claims that he can neutralize the tower to prevent that from happening, so the gang head back to the blue planet and oh look at that, the giant is already awake and he's blowing up some mountains. And woof, it's gonna be a long and drawn out apocalypse if this thing's movement speed is anything to go by. But the people of the blue planet are fed up with relying on our heroes, okay that's not really it, but every kingdom from all corners of the planet join forces to take on the giant, and it turns out some of our friends are still alive and kicking. Yang is alive, should have Sid could survive an explosion, I don't see why the macho monk couldn't. Edward is also back in good health, oh even Palom and Porum are back to normal. The gang's all here! Except Tella, he's still fucking dead. The giant is momentarily stunned thanks to the assault, allowing Cecil and the crew to head inside and destroy it from within. This involves a rematch with the four elemental archfiends and a battle against the giant's CPU, which sounds as exciting as fighting a CPU. When that's destroyed, Golbez says fuck and is pretty heated, but Fasoya does his little mind crush thing and snaps Golbez out of his mind control. Asking if he remembers his father's name, Golbez responds with Kluya, revealing that Cecil and Golbez are indeed brothers. It should be noted that Fusoya is brothers with Kluya, which will make him Cecil and Golbez's uncle, but that is never brought to attention now that I think about it. Isn't that something you think they would I don't know, mention at some capacity? Well, feeling remorseful for his past actions and not even thinking about asking for forgiveness, Golbez makes it his duty to stop Zemus once and for all, with Fusoya coming along to aid him. Cecil and the gang, however, are not too far behind as they want to stop Zemus as well. Cecil tries to get Rosa and Rydia to stay behind, stating it's too dangerous for them to come along, completely forgetting everything else they've been through at this point. But I love how Rosa and Rydia are quick to point out Cecil's bullshit and tag along anyway. Chivalry is nice and all, Cecil, but this clearly ain't the time for that shit. So it's to the moon! One final time, inside the lunar subterranean deep within the lunar core, Golbez and Fusoya are seen confronting Zemus, seemingly ending his life when they throw a combined Meteor spell at him. And what a visual downgrade for Golbez, joining the good side shrinks you down to sides like I'm looking at a Darth Vader Funko Pop. But death has only made Zemus stronger, for he is soon reborn as Zeromus, giving Golbez and Fusoya a taste of their own medicine, quickly putting them down for the count. With everyone's thoughts and prayers on the blue planet, though, Cecil and company find the strength within to vanquish Zeromus and end his ambitions once and for all. God, I love this backdrop for the final boss, combined with the main theme of Final Fantasy playing in the background. One of the best moments of the game's story. With Saromis dead, Fusoya bids farewell to our heroes, ready to resume his deep slumber, but Golbez asks if he may join him in his long sleep too, for he feels he cannot go back to the blue planet after everything he's done. Fusoya agrees to let him join, with Golbez saying one final goodbye to his brother, but before he leaves, Cecil responds in kind, acknowledging Golbez as his family as well. Peace is restored, Cecil and Rosa get married, Kane yawns and heads back to the mountains, and... That's the end of Final Fantasy IV. Quite a hefty story compared to the other three games, isn't it? This is it. This is where my plot summary skills are put to the test. I feel like I'm back in the Metal Gear marathon. But no, this story 
It's easy to follow, has some great beats, but it's not one of my favorites looking back. It's a little thin at points, not dedicating enough time on certain elements to make the payoffs more substantial. It moves a little too fast and doesn't have enough time to breathe and flesh characters out in a fulfilling way, likely a factor from a shorter than average length and development time. If my endgame clock is anything to go by, this isn't a very long RPG, even by Final Fantasy standards. These guys also fuck up a lot. In a way, it makes them endearing, gives them a nice uh, underdog quality. But fuck me, dude, they're borderline incompetent at times. The whole thing with the Golbez hand is probably the worst moment, as bizarre as that fucking sequence was. This is mainly Cecil's story, his journey to save the world from a tyrannical wizard that in a way you can see as a dark reflection of what Cecil could have potentially become if he stayed the path of the Dark Knight, which again I think would mean something more if it were shown that his study of the Dark Arts had more of an impact on him psychologically. It doesn't. So I feel the waters are a little muddy with that potential theme. Golbez still makes for a great villain. He's Darth Vader, there's just no questioning that. But you know what, that's fine. I love Darth Vader in the original Star Wars trilogy. He makes some mistakes, but his no-nonsense approach and his mission to collect the crystals gives him one hell of a threatening aura. It helps that his main theme is also just as sinister. It's disappointing that he's just a pawn for a greater villain that only makes an appearance at the end of the game. Zemus ain't no Emperor Palpatine, to put it that way. It's a little too generic for my liking. I would have preferred Golbez remain the sole villain for the sake of going deeper into his relationship with Cecil as brothers. Another Star Wars-esque moment. Do you think Square liked Star Wars? I think Square liked Star Wars. The juxtaposition between Cecil and Golbez had the most potential in the game's narrative, but there isn't much of that in totality. I do recall the 3D version giving Golbez a little bit of extra focus, and every little bit helps, but I still would have appreciated more of it. Everyone else fulfills a more supplemental role. They get their moment in the sun, and then they leave, or they pretend to die off for a bit. Edward, Yang, Palamon, Porum, Sid, some have more of an arc than others do to be fair, but none of them go as deep as Cecil's story. Tella definitely leaves a mark despite never going beyond his need for vengeance, again the issue is that things move too quickly to flesh things out, leaving conclusions unfulfilled or left an entirely optional side quest that still end rather anticlimatically or don't follow up on previous events as well as they should. You can visit the Feymark in the Underworld, the place that Rydia was taken to after Leviathan crashed the boat you were riding on the way to Baron. You can later fight Leviathan to earn him as a summon, he attacked the boat because he wanted to protect Rydia as the last summoner alive on the blue planet. But is the boat incident ever brought up? Does Cecil ever confront the dude saying, hey you piece of shit, you made me think my friends died and I'm pretty sure you killed those innocent crew members. Nope, that never happens. Granted, that moment when Rydia saves your skin from Goldbez's attack is still the highlight of her character and without disappearing for a bit, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. The fact that story beats can now play out in battles is something that help emphasizes the tension and stakes of the encounter and predicament. The Rydia encounter, when Edge confronts his mutated parents in the Tower of Babel, all of these are enhanced because they happen in battle. How are things going to turn out, either through scripted events or your actions? You're not sure, but that's what makes it exciting. And there are plenty of moments I enjoy in the game that are not even related to the story, but in the world around the story. A lot of towns have these dancers you can speak with and they put on a little show for you. One you can even spend 10,000 gil to watch once and then you reset your game because why the hell would you spend 10,000 gil on that shit. But this also has some extra payoff when you visit Troya because it's a kingdom governed by women who share the same sprites as the dancers, but the moment you talk to them you get scolded for thinking they're dancers when they're actually warriors. Get fucked Cecil, love that moment. Go back to reading that porno mag, you lonely fuck. To go into the other characters though, Rosa is just Cecil's girlfriend. She's got a good soul and wants to be by Cecil's side to protect him, that's fine, but doesn't go much beyond that. Way better healing magic than the sage from last time, now that's a fucking cure for you show them Rosa. Kane, for being a longtime friend of Cecil, is also not incredibly significant besides being the dude who backstabs the party twice because of mind control antics. He harbors feelings for Rosa as well, and I think there was an attempt to write a love triangle dynamic between the three, but that isn't given much focus considering Kane isn't in the game for a significant amount of time to spend developing that. He's got the same problem Leon did in Final Fantasy 2. I mean the other Final Fantasy 2. The same goes for Edge, it's terrible how he had to watch his parents become monstrous because of Dr. Lugay's experiments, and then watch them take their own lives when they regain consciousness, and it's awesome how he taps into that newfound rage and unlocks the rest of his ninjutsu abilities before the battle against Rubicante. That said, you're already about three-fourths into the game when Edge joins the party, he doesn't get much else besides that one moment. Afterwards, he's your ninja to do with as you please, and he secretly has a crush on Rydia which isn't touched upon until the sequel I want to say? I don't remember, it's been too long since I played the After Years. Right, the direct sequel. I had a few of you asking how I was going to tackle games that had direct sequels. I'm not really worried about that right now. In After Years case, this was a game released around 17 years after the original game. Not that I'm going to have you guys wait that long for a review of the game, I hope not anyway. But in my eyes, this isn't the same as going from Final Fantasy X to Final Fantasy X-2. The priority isn't as strong. It will happen, but it ain't happening now.
You know, looking back in some way, it's appropriate that the pacing of Final Fantasy IV is breakneck, because this was the game that changed up the battle system to be much faster too. No longer do you simply select actions one character at a time and then watch everything unfold, Final Fantasy IV was the first game to introduce the active time battle system, where time is always in motion. You select commands and other actions while other characters and enemies are in the middle of their turns. Things are always moving in Final Fantasy IV's battles, and it's a little daunting, especially going from the older games and into this. I was sort of caught off guard how fast battles were proceeding. And should it be a little much for you, you can set the time flow from active to wait. Time freezes when you're selecting commands while in wait mode, giving you more room to breathe. Leave it on active though, those enemies are more than happy to continuously chomp on your neck as you pick your next spell or target. But that's the other thing about this, certain actions also have different charge periods. Spells are the most obvious with this, the stronger the spell, the longer it takes to cast. As much as you want to blast the enemy away with flare or medio, is it worth the wait in this new battle system? Maybe you're better off using something like Bio, one of my favorite spells in the game actually because of its reliable power and short cast time. And I don't know, there's something about the way it sounds in the 16-bit original. The job system doesn't make a return in Final Fantasy IV. Given the linear progression of the story, your party comp is ever changing but at the same time rigid. You're always going to have a combination of physical fighters and magic users. Magic users especially, Rydia, Tella, Rosa, Palamon, Porum, and Fusoya. This game loves their white and black mages, so I hope you love them just as much. I never took the time to notice Tella's a mono artwork here. This dude's putting himself on a platter. This is seductive, right? Oh yeah, have you guys ever seen the Nintendo Power Magazine where Final Fantasy IV was featured? Check those illustrations when you can because it's on a similar wavelength as the artwork from the Final Fantasy I guide, you know, the Geriatric Four. Let's see, Cecil lost his pants, Kane's ass refuses to fit in any, and damn what a bulge. Rosa looks like she's in the wrong era. Rydia, I don't know if this is supposed to be her younger or older self, not even close either way. Edward wishes he could look this fierce in the actual game. Oh my god, Palm and Porum. Why are they Tweedledee and Tweedledum? Yang isn't bad though, I kinda like this. Sit looks like the king of Hyrule and check those yellow shorts. Tell a holy shit he looks like he smells like a plastic covered couch. And Edge, the dashing young prince, looks almost as old as Tella. And what is this posture? Eh, what can you do? I'm sorry, I had to mention that for a bit. Anyway, up to five party members at once, a step above the usual four, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the only game in the mainline series that isn't an MMO to do this. After this, it's back to four, and some even shrink it down to three. Assuming you're not playing the initial American release on the Super Nintendo, every character also comes with a unique skill to set them apart, because without those, some of these guys were a little similar and redundant, but at the same time, some of these skills aren't that stellar, so I can maybe understand why they were removed from the American release at all. I never use Tella's recall ability because I'd rather use a spell I know will work instead of relying on RNG to get something good. And later on, he gets all the spells back anyway, so yeah. Cecil in his Dark Knight class can unleash a dark wave that's great for clearing out mobs at the cost of some HP. Early on, this makes battles go by so fast it's great. But then he has something like Prey from Rosa, which could be a free low-level heal spell if it decides to work. Why has God abandoned me for this round? You're better off using Edward's Salve, which takes a single potion in your inventory and splits it among the group. Not bad for an early game heal. Yang can charge up his attack to hit extra hard during his next turn, to which you might think, wouldn't it be better if you just attack twice in a row, to which I say sure, but if the monster or boss is prone to counterattacking, that's less damage you gotta deal with in response. Kane could jump like Dragoons could do in Final Fantasy III, Sid can look at an enemy and say, yep, that sure is an enemy. Like I said, it's more rigid compared to Final Fantasy III, but the options you have give you an edge in combat if you understand how it works in your favor. And characters like Cecil, especially after becoming a paladin, can even rock different weapon types. While more than proficient in swordplay, he can also rock a bow and arrow and stay in the back row, which also helps him absorb more damage because he can guard other players when he becomes a paladin later on. Which isn't a bad idea for your track through that damn magnet cave where you can't use anything metallic, otherwise you're paralyzed. Um, on second thought, this place sucks, just run away from everything. Just be ready to run away a lot because, oh god, I forgot how high the encounter rate was for Final Fantasy IV. Inside caves and dungeons, goodness, it feels like every other step. And with some enemy formations, if you get ambushed or back attacked, it's gonna be a while before you can run away. The bats inside certain caves, you could fight up to like six of them at once and they all do the same drain attack. And I'm just sitting there like... Oh, thank God. Finally. 
Running from battles has never been easier though, and thankfully your defense doesn't drop to zero during the attempt, that was just bullshit. And you don't have to worry about switching party rows back to normal if you switch them mid-battle. <laughs> it's good to be back to a battle system I'm fonder of. It's got its sour points, and if you don't keep an active mind, you can pay the price if you don't remain steady on your toes. But getting high damage rolls with sword strikes, taking advantage of elemental weaknesses with strong magic and watching those numbers fly, spell charges are gone, I'm not gonna say for good this time because last time I said that I paid the price, <sighs> but magic points from Final Fantasy 2 are back, thank god. And I love finding new ways to win battles. If you're playing this game, don't sleep on status magic like Pig or Confuse because some enemies have bizarre reactions that I didn't even know about until giving it a go for this review. How you can cause a chain reaction with bombs with a simple thunder spell. How you can cause a giant worm to retreat if you hit them with a Confuse spell. I guess I have my previous reviews to thank for that, but trying out all sorts of different things is the spice of life in RPGs, Final Fantasy being no exception. If you think the enemy is getting too many turns at once, give them a slow spell or see if they're vulnerable to stop magic. Halt their movements completely and then wail on their defenseless asses. Use haste and berserk to get first dibs with your strongest physical fighter. Just make sure you set up some proper defenses or things can get out of hand fast because your dude doesn't know when to stop. Is it fun throughout? No. For as much love I have for the game, there are some places I never look forward to visiting. Most of them being in the underworld looking back. The sealed cave. Overload it with those damn trap doors that you have to fight if you want to proceed. They can one-shot a character, then transform into another monster that can also push your shit in. You don't know which door leads to a treasure or a dead end, it's the worst aspects of Final Fantasy 2 back in full swing, and I mean this Final Fantasy 2. And the boss at the end against the demon wall? Ugh. If he manages to get you, he starts one-shotting your characters with Crush. It's an intense boss, I mean, I love how anxious it makes me. But after the trap door shit, I'm more annoyed than anything. I'm normally skipping this entire dungeon thanks to a glitch I can do with the warp spell. Final Fantasy IV is one of the only RPGs I ever considered speedrunning because I find the strategies and planning of certain glitches and step routes to be fascinating and not as daunting to pull off. Like, it's no Excalibur 2 shit from Final Fantasy IX. I can save that for that game later. If I were to get serious with it, it'd probably be with the first American release, but that's cool. I just love the fact that I can skip to the final boss by climbing 64 sets of stairs. I mean, do you see some of these encounters you can run into in the core? Double behemoths? No thank you. I just mean whatever the fuck this thing is supposed to be. And there's also Zemus' breath? That's disgusting, and he won't stop checking me out. Does this guy seriously do anything else? All he does is use search, and I usually kill him before he gets the chance to do anything if I'm not running away. Does he do anything else? I don't know. The Sylph Cave is also pretty bad, but this place is completely optional. It's filled with these damage tiles that you need the float spell in order to bypass safely, which Rosa doesn't learn until around level 35, I think. So it's sort of level gated if you don't want to purposefully damage yourself and heal afterwards. Not the best idea considering the encounters of the area. A lot of dudes that hurt physically or wreck your day with status effects or something like these toad sages would just waste your fucking time with the endless barrage of toad spells. You know what though, there isn't a single place here that made me as angry or exhausted as any of the worst dungeons in the other games. No splitting enemies, no crystal tower. There's the Tower of Babel and the Lunar Subterranean towards the end of the game is sort of like the crystal tower given the structure and the kind of enemies you face. But if there's one thing, one thing that makes all the difference comparing these dungeons to those is something you see as early as your visit to the water cave. <laughs> Save points. Save points in dungeons. Oh, I missed you so, so much. Yeah, I know I was using emulation to play the other games and I could always use save states to soften the blow, but you know what I could also do with save points here? Use a tent or a cabin, refill my HP and mana, take the fucking edge off, make it so I can get away with grinding some enemies without having to leave the entire fucking place just to go take a nap in someone else's bed. Oh, it's good to be back. So good to be back. But exploring dungeons has its rewards too because you can find hidden passageways that have extra goodies that, especially early on, could be a real game changer if you practice a little patience. Find some extra weapons that you might not need a Cecil, but Edge is more than happy to chuck it at an enemy for some extra damage. The Sacred Blade of Excalibur? <laughs> if you're a stickler for post-game content, you won't get much from the original release. It's bare bones. There is the Sylph Cave like I mentioned, and I would recommend you clear it as soon as possible because you get that nifty Sylph summon and you get some comic relief with Yang here. You find him unconscious, so you head back to his wife and she gives you a frying pen and then you wake his ass up with a good ah! The fame mark is kind of similar. It also requires a float spell if you don't want to damage your feet on these glowing tiles. It's an overall easier self cave, but the bosses at the end can give you trouble if you go at them with the wrong strategy like what I was doing here. Don't do what I did, even if I did make it work out. 
So again, I recommend you get the PSP version based on the advanced release, has a ton of trials for every character, and lets you swap party members with others that were originally only available in certain story sections. There's no trick to leveling up, the more goons you fight, the more experience and gold you get, making you stronger and more capable. And with mages in this game, they learn new spells and abilities when they level up as well, so you don't have to worry about needing money to expand your spell list. Shops in the town are stocked with new equipment that isn't terribly expensive, and items like Phoenix Downs are now inexpensive purchases in shops so you can splurge them and not worry about being crippled during your next dungeon run. Inventory can still use a little work if you're playing the SNES game, but they finally added a sort button that stacks up all the items nice and neat. Though it doesn't categorize the items into different types, and key items for the fourth time in a row were not separated from regular items. That wouldn't be introduced until later. You can still summon the fat chocobo to store items away you don't need, and before you get your first airship, you can use the new black chocobo to fly across the rain, maybe visit a few places previously inaccessible. Uh, they call them black chocobos though, but they're definitely blue. Maybe it was a color limitation, they could only land in force too, and the moment you hitch a second ride, they automatically go back to the force you caught them in. There's uh, not much in freedom there. But you can always use that next visit to the Chocobo Forest to talk to the white Chocobo and get a free mana refill. With one or two exceptions, there's no encounter I find overly bullshit. There's a strategy for everything in this game, and most don't require obtuse solutions that goes against the principles of the combat system itself. And they don't just boil down to using the same two or three spells like previously, although I will spam Bahamut when I can. I just love seeing the dude in action. This was yet another game where I was playing without even really thinking about the review process. I didn't take many notes because I, I just forgot to. I was absorbed in the moment, the memories, the nostalgia. I can never tire of this game, and it isn't even one of my favorites in the series, but it was my first, and it just so happens that my first Final Fantasy was remarkably beginner friendly. Progression is super linear. Yes, it limits your exploration options because even when you get your first airship, one of three, there isn't much to do besides visiting some other towns that you don't really need to visit. And it isn't until much later when you can start exploring some optional dungeons that do have some cool rewards like additional summons for Rydia to unleash like Odin and Bahamut. This game is super vanilla by today's standards. That's a totally fair assessment. It's not that remarkable. Compared to other games in the franchise and other RPGs, especially in 2021, I don't know if I can say Final Fantasy IV is as good as a gateway to the whole RPG genre now as it was then. Back in the early 90s, there certainly wasn't as much competition, dear God, especially in the Western market. But nowadays, folks have a near limitless selection of RPGs to hop into across many consoles, Western or Eastern style. You've got your Persona 5s, you've got your Bravely Defaults, your Elder Scrolls. RPGs today look better and they sound better. You just have to take my word that Final Fantasy IV is still a good game because what it does, it still does well. This is always the first Final Fantasy I recommend to newbies looking to get started somewhere in the series, and it's not because it's where I started, but because it's easy to pick up no matter the version. Well, okay, maybe not the 3D version, but I don't know, if you never played the original and went straight into this one, you probably wouldn't even notice the drastically changed enemy design, so maybe it's worth a shot, you decide. But whatever you decide to do, Final Fantasy IV is a keeper and would set the standard for future games. It made me the RPG enthusiast I am today, and that's one thing I can always thank and cherish the most from playing this game. The active time battle system was here to stay, the faster pace was here to stay. Final Fantasy was in the next generation, and for Square, it was a whole different playground. Hey everybody, it is uh, 7.30 in the morning, some call me Johnny coming at you live with an alternate, completely unplanned ending I have for this video because uh, I shot all the live action shots for this review a couple days prior to like editing all that, and it wasn't until just like this morning when I realized, oh, the focus is way off for this one shot, or uh, the audio is really off for this one shot, and I can't reshoot it because I, I again, I shot those shots uh, a couple days prior, and I can't recreate those shots exactly like I had them before without there being some noticeable differences, like more facial hair for one thing. Maybe my face is not as greasy as some of those shots were. So uh, instead of just trying to lose sleep over it, I'm just going to give you guys a proper send off for this video. And uh, well, <laughs> it really sucks when you're caught with your pants down like this and you don't know exactly how to do it besides you just Fuck it. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in and watching this behemoth of a video. Still not as long as my 06 video, but I'm close. I'm really fucking close, damn it. I feel this is it. This is gonna be the marathon where I finally fucking do it. And what game will it be next? I don't know, but I guess you'll have to wait and see. With all that said, thank you all for watching. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask if you decide to go outside, get vaccinated if possible. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care.